And let me know when you're ready for me to share the screen. Absolutely. First, I want to introduce you. Mm -hmm. Yep. Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today is the last Wednesday of the month, which means it's time for the Lifestyle Docs, your prescription for wellness, Dr. Munish and Vandana Chala. And today they're going to be talking about food as medicine, eating for health and wellness. They're going to be covering a different pillar of lifestyle medicine every month. And today it's nutrition. Please welcome them back to the show. It's so nice to see you again. It's nice to be back on Chef AG Live. I know. It's so great that you guys are doing this as a team. That would be difficult if only one of you was on board, wouldn't it? Yeah. It would be, yes. Yes, it does make it better and nicer this way. I love it. I feel bad for the mixed households. It makes it so much more difficult. So nutrition is the one pillar I think that everybody, like, that's the one they seem to go to first. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's so much confusion, you know in social media and uh, online, that is the one thing I'm hoping people really kind of get good fundamentals. So we're going to kind of focus on some of the foundation. You know, how do we know some of the things that, you know, plant-based experts say that this is how we should eat? So I'm going to give some backing. And I think your audience are sophisticated enough. Some of the slides are a little bit technical, but I think that it should be just fine. I love slides. I can't tell you, you know, so many doctors just want to talk and, and that's great, but I, you know, slides just draw my attention to like, I feel like, okay, well, I better pay attention because it's written down. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, great. Well, whenever you're ready. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And I'm going to move out of the way and I'll come in for the second part. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. And can everyone see that okay? Yeah, you might want to change it into slideshow because we're seeing the slides at the side right. as well. Let me change it from the beginning. Maybe I should have done that part first. Okay. okay. How's that? Perfect now. It's perfect. Okay. So as Chef AJ uh, mentioned, we're going to talk about prescription or well for wellness with the lifestyle docs. And our focus is going to be on nutrition. So this is the uh, first pillar, or we think the most important pillar of lifestyle medicine. And that's why we're going to talk about it um, on our first show here. So first, we're going to go over a few objective objectives, look at the chronic disease epidemic, reevaluating, you know, why is this occurring? Why is our current medical model not working so well? Then we'll dive deeper into the benefits of whole foods, plant-based diet, and we'll kind of share the evidence with you. And then we'll focus on, well, we have all this evidence, how to put this in practice. Okay, so this is no surprise to anyone that there's an epidemic of obesity, diabetes, heart disease, autoimmune diseases, and even you know with uh, genomics and all these things, cancer rates keep rising. So the question is, you know, even we're spending trillions of dollars on healthcare, why can't we get these chronic diseases under control? And just to give you a quick example, I think my, uh, we showed this last time, but just to remind everyone, in 1958, there were only 1 million people with diabetes in the United States. And that number went up to uh, 14, 15 million uh, by 2005 and 18 million by 2006. And that number today is at 37 million. So in about 16 years, we have more than double the people who have diabetes. And that's not, and it's even scarier than that. People who have pre-diabetes, meaning they have insulin resistance, meaning they have a metabolic abnormality, that they can't handle the carbohydrates, can't handle the food that they eat because they have a metabolic issue, now stands at 96 million. So if you uh, combine pre-diabetes and diabetes, folks with insulin resistance and put it all in one bucket, that's 40% of the American population. So, I mean, that's a staggering number. And there's two main causes we feel, the main cause being food, you know, what we're eating. We're eating about 60% of processed foods, which is added fats, oils in particular, added sugar, refined grains, all these things, they have very little nutritional value, but high calories. And these are the foods, you know, that you get in the center of the grocery store, the processed foods. 
Another 25 to 30% is coming from animal foods, you know, meat, dairy, eggs, fish, seafood. And this is where saturated fat is predominantly coming from, cholesterol. And it says here 12%, it's even scarier than that. It's actually less than that, that people are eating whole plant foods. So this is, we feel like the major reason why we have a chronic disease epidemic. The second reason, and this is, you know, what we are both volunteer clinical faculty at University of Houston College of Medicine. And we really want to uh, kind of show the new generation of doctors that our current model, our acute care model for chronic diseases is not working very well. So we really need to steer towards lifestyle medicine with nutrition being a key pillar because our current model, you know, it came about in the early 1900s. In the early 1900s, 60% of the deaths were due to trauma and infection. You know, uh, trauma was about 15 to 20% and infection, whether it's TB, pneumonia, viral illnesses, they accounted for 40%. So combined, 60% of deaths in the year 1900 were due to trauma infection. But today, or I should say in 2010, only 9% of the deaths are from trauma infection. And 85% of the deaths in 2010 are due to chronic diseases. So it doesn't make very much sense that we keep using the same model. You know, if you have a pneumonia, antibiotics work wonders. It can be life-saving. If you get in a car wreck, you have a hip fracture or bleeding internally, you know, surgery is going to save your life. But when you have diabetes, heart disease, obesity, medications and procedures are not the main tool that's going to help this. And, you know, as is obvious. So what is going to help? Then the question is diet and lifestyle. And this is where lifestyle medicine comes in. And I just love this graphic because it just very clearly shows that we have to eat the right foods, you know, increase our physical uh, activity, develop healthy ways to manage stress, have uh, form and maintain community and relationships like the lovely community that Chef AJ has cultivated here, take care of our sleep and really stay away from tobacco and other substances. That as we were mentioning, we're going to focus on food today. And this is evidence-based. Uh, lifestyle medicine is an evidence-based field. And this is sort of the upshot that we need to increase our fruits, vegetables, nuts and seeds, grains, uh, beans, lentils, and other legumes, and really reduce processed foods and animal foods. And if you can go all the way, even better. But you know, at the beginning step, we really need to increase our whole plant foods. So then the question is, you know, why should we do this? You know, what's, what is it going to do for me? So we're not going to go over every one of these, otherwise it'd be a two hour lecture, but we're going to go over, you know, why are the macronutrients from plant foods superior? And we'll look at epigenetics and microbiome. These two are really empowering. And this is, they're relatively new fields in medicine. I think they're really kind of show us how our body works. So what do I mean by superior macronutrients? So our body needs fat, body needs carbohydrates, body needs protein. We want to supply those nutrients in the most healthful way. And plant foods are going to have polyunsaturated fatty acids, monounsaturated fatty acids. And as a general rule, other than tropical oils, it's going to have very little saturated fats and no trans fats. So these are the foods that are going to cause insulin resistance, heart disease, raising our cholesterol if there's too much saturated fat and trans fats. And that is what is really high in animal foods. So we need fat, you know, small amount, but we need to get it from healthy sources. And carbohydrates, if we get them in whole plant foods, you're getting lots of fiber. This is almost a forgotten nutrient. You know, my patients want to talk about their protein deficiency, but I remind them 97% of Americans are not getting enough fiber. And fiber is present only in whole plant foods. There's no fiber in animal foods and very little fiber in processed foods. And all the micronutrients, you know, plant foods are just so such a rich source. And protein, a lot of people are concerned. Well, if I stop doing animal foods, am I going to get enough protein? And they've heard about essential amino acids. They think that plants are not going to have this. And this is, you know, just a, you know, myth, you know, just really caught on in social media and other places. But this is literally not true. You get plenty of 
amino acids, essential amino acids from plant foods. And the good thing is the packaging is it doesn't contain the saturated fat. The way that the protein is, it causes less inflammation in the body. In fact, it's anti-inflammatory. So this is what I mean by superior micronutrients. So I, you know, I said a bunch of things that saturated fat is not so good for us. Animal protein is not so good for us. How do we know that this is really true? So this is where I really want to want to go into the science that you know how do researchers, how do physicians, how do societies make decisions on what to tell their patients to eat? So we have I've kind of broken it up, and this is you know not my slide. This is from Open. Oregon. And a lot of the information we get from non-human studies, from cell culture studies, animal studies, and then we get a lot of information from epidemiological studies like the China study, their cohort studies, and I'll go over them in a little bit more detail in just a bit. And then there are interventional studies where we take a group of people and we change one parameter. Maybe we add exercise or maybe we add whole plant foods and see how their you know, medical diseases, you know, how they change. And finally, we have meta-analysis or systemic reviews, where we look at all these, all these studies from different parts of the pyramid and really see, okay, what, are they, what do they all have in common? So when every part of the pyramid, the non-human studies, the observational studies, the interventional studies, the systemic reviews, if they all say that plant foods are really healthy for us, we can feel really good about that, right? There is congruence in every part of medical research. So this is uh, the most technical slide that I have, and this is an example of basic sciences research. So this is what I, my first thing that I try to get people to do is to reduce their animal protein and reduce refined sugar. And I show them this. I said, this is what you know, excess animal protein and excess sugar is doing to your body through, you know, the mechanism or the pathways are not important, but when you have extra animal protein, it's going to increase your IGF-1. And this is a growth factor. Secondly, it also activates the mTOR pathways. And all this is going to lead to aging, uh, damage to our cells, damage to our DNA. And this is the recipe for chronic diseases. I love this little, uh, uh, photo right here, you know, everybody wants to look like the woman on the left. But if we keep eating lots of animal protein and lots of sugar, eventually this is going to happen much sooner. But if you eat the foods that are healthy for us, whole plant foods, we can really delay this. And sugar, you know, through a different mechanism, it causes cellular aging, causes damage to our DNA, and sets us up for chronic diseases. Okay, in epigenetics, a lot of the research has also been done in non-human studies, but some in human studies and some in cell culture studies. So a lot of you may already know about epigenetics, but for some of you who may not, I just wanna briefly go over it. So epi means over or around, and genetics you know, stands for genes. So genes are what is inherited from our parents, but they don't come in like a specific package. Some of the genes like hair color or eye color, that's what you get, that's what's gonna happen. But most of the disease related to our metabolism, they either turn on and off depending on the So if our diet is healthy, we're exercising, we're managing our stress well, we're sleeping really well, different set of genes turn on. But if we are eating lots of animal foods and processed foods and not you know, taking care of our stress and not sleeping very well and are sedentary, a different set of genes turn on. So this is really empowering. I really tell my patients, you have control over your health destiny. Just because your father had diabetes, it doesn't mean you have to have diabetes. You can improve all these pillars of lifestyle medicine, especially diet. And through the power of epigenetics, you know, you don't have to have these chronic diseases. And the last thing I want to cover, because there's so much research going on in the microbiome. So we human beings, we are not one organism. The microorganisms that are on us, around us, inside us, and most of them are in the colon, they are an integral part. They are needed for good health. 70% of our immune system is in the gut. And most of these micro, uh, microorganisms, they live in the gut, especially in the colon. And so what do they do? 
they are talking to our body, talking to our immune system all the time. In fact, in infancy, they train our immune system. They are useful in regulating our metabolism. You know, if two people are eating the same amount of food and one is gaining weight, it may be their microbiome. They also control our appetite and satiety. So, I mean, they have powerful influence on how our hormones function when we feel full. And even this is really fascinating. There's more and more research coming up that our mood and brain function and cognitive health is related to the microorganisms that we have in our colon. So again, this is very empowering because we can choose which microorganisms we want to thrive. If we want the healthy microorganisms that are gonna do all these positive things for us, the food they need is fiber. If we give them fiber, they thrive and they... So let me go over terminology a little bit. Uh, so prebiotics are fiber that is specific that the bacteria like to eat. Probiotics are the bacteria and postbiotics are the wonderful chemicals that they produce, uh, short chain fatty acids, which train our immune system, regulate our metabolism, you know, influence our satiety and brain mood and function. So if we feed them lots of fiber, lots of prebiotics, and we have the healthy bacteria, and if we give them fiber, these guys grow. If we give them meat and processed foods, the unhealthy, the inflammatory bacteria grow. So we have a lot of power on how you know, our gut functions simply through our diet. Okay. So those were sort of examples of largely, I would say, basic sciences research. Now I'm going to move on to what are called observational studies. So these studies, they take large numbers of populations, 60,000, 80,000, 100,000, and they follow them from 15 years, 20 years, and they see, okay, these people are eating a certain way, and these people are eating a different way. How is that showing up? You know, what kind of diseases are they getting? So the Adventist health studies are really very useful in this sense because the Adventists in general, they all are very active in their lifestyle. As a group, they don't uh, smoke or drink hardly at all. They are all very community oriented, really uh, you know, go to church every day and have a really nice community. So it really lets us tease out that if all of these uh, folks are practicing the other healthy pillars of lifestyle medicine, and the food is the only thing that's different, it gives us really good information, right? Then we can say, okay, it's the food that's related to the obesity, right? I guess this is, you know, being overweight, but you can just see the less animal foods you have, the lower your BMI. And the less BMI you have, you know, this is very directly related to diabetes. And here you can see, you know, people who are vegan or whole food plant-based, they have the lowest incidence of diabetes. So again, we have congruence from basic sciences, congruence from observational studies. And then let's look at an example of an interventional study. This is when uh, researchers and physicians, and I think everyone on the call is likely familiar with Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, the work that he did at the Cleveland Clinic. And this would be an example of an interventional study. So they took patients that were at their clinic that other cardiologists didn't necessarily want and they enrolled them in this study. And the intervention was just whole foods, plant-based diet. And one of the knock is that, you know, people can't sustain this, they're not very compliant. Well, in this study, they gave them support, they gave them coaching, but 89% were compliant. So 198 patients were signed up and all had pretty uh, significant coronary artery disease. And this wasn't a randomized control trial. Everybody who wanted to sign up was able to sign up. But the way the res results were uh, tabulated, it really kind of randomized itself because 89% were compliant and 11% were not compliant. They kind of went back to the standard American diet, high in animal foods and processed foods. So in the whole foods plant-based diet, uh, 177 patients remained compliant and only one person had an adverse outcome, which was a stroke. In the, let's see, 21 patients that were not compliant, 13 of them, 62% of them had an adverse outcome. 
an adverse outcome was having a uh, cardiac uh, event, a heart attack, stroke, death, anything requiring a hospitalization or stent placement or unstable angina. So you can just see those who are uh, compliant, one out of 177 suffered an adverse event and 13 of the 22 who were not compliant had an adverse event. I mean, this should be on the front page of New York Times. I mean, this, we have so much power that we can literally reverse heart disease, as you can see in the uh, picture to the right. You know, you've got this artery has lots of plaque and irregular narrowing. And just from plant foods alone, you know, blood is flowing, it's open right back up. Okay. And a lot of times in the social media, we'll get a knock that there's not very many randomized controlled trials in the plant-based literature. Well, that is changing, especially in the last 15, 20 years. So this is a broad study. This was done in New Zealand, and they uh, included folks from ages 35 to 70, and they had to have obesity and one chronic disease. And they divided the folks randomly into the arm of whole plant foods or the usual medical care where the doctor just encourages you to eat healthy. And they, they gave uh, some coaching support to the whole food group, bi-weekly coaching for 12 weeks. They shared recipes with them, but this was, that, was the, that was it for the intervention. And they encouraged people, showed them some data that if you eat this way, you're going to lose weight. And lo and behold, after six months, the folks in the whole food plant-based group lost 3.9 kilograms, almost nine pounds. So a lot of studies, you'll see that people will lose weight in six months, but when they follow folks at 12 months, people regain the weight. Well, in this study, they kept it going for another six months. And at 12 months, the folks had lost an additional amount. So now they were down 4.2 kilograms, over nine pounds. Whereas the other group, they gained about uh, 1.2 kilograms in the other arm of the study. So randomized clinical trial, people were not restricted on how much they could eat. They were just highly encouraged to eat whole plant foods and without even increasing physical activity, they were able to lose weight, lower their medications and the things that were noticeable that their lipids improved, cholesterol went down and A1C also went down, marker for uh, diabetes. So the last thing I want is the uh, systematic reviews, the meta-analysis. So these organizations, the World Health Organization, American Institute of Cancer Research, American Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, American College of Cardiology, they are looking at the literature. They are looking at what is the preponderance of evidence on what we can do to meet the challenges of chronic disease you know, in our society. And this, these recommendations here, all of them recommend. You can go to their website and they all say, we need to increase our fruits and vegetables, increase whole plant foods. We need to reduce saturated fats. And what does that mean? That means we need to decrease cheese and high fat dairy is the number one contributor of saturated fat in the American diet and meat would be number two. They also recommend reduce added salt and sugar. And this is coming in from all the packaged foods, the sodas, the crackers, and the chips. And all of them agree we need to increase physical activity and maintain a healthy body weight. You know, if you do the first four, you're not going to have to struggle with maintaining a healthy body weight. So now that I've kind of covered, you know, some of the research, and I'm sure there are some questions, but before we get to that, I'm going to have Dr. B come back and she can show you how to put this knowledge into practice. All right. Okay. So now we know what we need to do and why we need to do it in terms of the evidence. But for many of my patients, the how um, is very difficult. They've watched the documentaries and they know that they want to be on a whole food plant-based diet and they want to take out the animal foods and the processed foods, but they need help doing it. So you know, in terms of recommendations for prevention, we do recommend getting 90 to 95% of your calories from whole plant foods. We want our patients to minimize oils um, and sugars, eliminate processed meats, and also 
reduce or eliminate other animal products, but we start off with processed meats first. And we have them focus a lot on calorie density and nutrient density and actually show them um, Chef AJ's um, infographics on calorie density as well, which is very helpful for a lot of people. And we'll go over that in a second. Um, and then for many of my patients, intermittent fasting is very helpful as well. So this is one of the charts that I like to go over in terms of calorie density and nutrient density. So what we see in nature is in general, the foods that are really high in calorie density tend to be really low in nutrients. For instance, the highest thing you see on this chart is oil, which is super high in calorie density and super low in nutrient density. And on the other side, the thing that you see with the lowest calories is greens, non-starchy veggies. For that, you eat a whole pound of that and you get 100 calories. So it's very low in calories, but it's very high in the nutrients. That's true for most plant foods. As you look on the left side of the graph is plant foods and right side is more um, animal and processed foods except for the one exception, as you can see, of nuts and seeds. So nuts and seeds, even though they're whole plant foods, they are high in both density and nutrient density. Um, so it's perfectly fine to eat some of those if your, your um, goal is just disease prevention. But if your goal is weight loss, then I do have my patients not eat those as well, because as you can see, it's 2,800 calories a pound when you eat nuts and seeds. So as Chef AJ says, we try to stay 600 calories a pound and less, and that way you can eat large amounts um, of those foods without having to worry. So this is something that we discuss with our patients, um, especially when it comes to disease reversal. Um, for those patients, we really want them to take out sofas from their diet altogether. So the first S is for sugar, the O is for oil, F is for flour, and A is actually for two things. It's animal products and alcohol. Maybe we should put another little mm -hmm. picture of a drink down there. Um, and the second S is for salt. Um, so we Really, the patients who are trying to do diabetes reversal or put their autoimmune disease in remission, um, we have them stay away from the sofas. And when we have them stay away from the sofas, of course, one of the first questions that comes up is if I stop the animal products, how will I get my protein? And Dr. M mentioned that, and I'm sure you guys have heard it as well. Um, so we have to show them that there is plenty of protein in plant foods, in all plant foods, and in some plant foods, quite a bit, almost pretty much as much as animal foods. For instance, 100 grams of beans versus 100 grams of beef has about the same amount of protein. Iron is actually higher in beans. There's no saturated fat or cholesterol in beans. Um, and as Dr. M said, there is no fiber in any animal foods and lots of plant foods such as beans. The other question we get is, how will I get my calcium when we tell people to take dairy off of their diet? And um, so here's another uh, slide we like to show. And actually, um, these slides we learned from uh, something we had watched on Chef AJ, right? It was Dr. Razan um, Oliveira who had um, showed these comparisons. And we're like, oh yeah, this is what people ask. We need to, we need to make a slide of this. Um, so as you can see, eight ounces of tofu versus eight ounces of milk, uh, roughly the same amount of calcium, roughly the same amount of protein, a um, lot more sugar in milk, a lot more saturated fat, a lot more fat, cholesterol. Um, so we can get our calcium also from dark leafy greens, from other beans and lentils. Um, from tofu, there's several sources of protein and calcium in plant-based food. And then another question that we get is, well, when I go on a plant-based diet, I'm going to have to eat a lot of carbohydrates. 
and carbohydrates are bad for you, right? So the um, education that we do there is carbohydrates are good or bad depending on what is added to them and what is taken away from them. So here's a picture of whole grain, which has the endosperm, the germ, and the bran. But when it becomes refined grain, the bran, which is the fiber part, and the germ, which has all the vitamins, like B vitamins, um, is stripped off. And when you hear like, enriched flour, basically what they're doing is adding on some of the um, B vitamins and some of the iron back that has been stripped off. Uh, but of course, they're not adding on any fiber um, in the enriched fl flour. So when you're eating whole grains like brown rice, quinoa, oats, that's, that's good carbs. But when you're eating refined grains like wh white bread and pasta and pretzels, those are not healthy carbs. So here's a picture I like to show when I'm telling my patients that um, the carbs that are coming from Mother Nature, from Mother Earth, from the ground, those are healthy carbs. But the carbs that are coming from a fast food drive through um, or a factory or a plant that makes chips, those are the unhealthy carbs. So then it gets to the practical tips. So many of my patients will start with one plant-based meal a day. And if that's a big meal, often one third or even more of their calories are now coming from plant-based foods. So I encourage them to go ahead and start with at least getting the breakfast plant-based. So we'll figure out what they're eating currently. Um, if they're having cereal with dairy milk, we'll switch to a plant-based milk, but then we also pay attention to what cereal they're eating because many of them are super unhealthy and switching to something more like rolled oats, maybe um, something that's easy and even cheaper uh, and much healthier. If they're having scrambled eggs, often we'll switch to tofu scramble, donut or muffin, encourage them to do a whole grain toast with avocado. Um, so we kind of make little changes at first. So it's doable for them um, because a lot of times when they try to do things very quickly and drastically, then it's not sustainable and they often go back. Snacks, we get a lot of questions about what plant-based snacks I can eat. If they're looking for that crunch, um, then maybe going from things like potato chips to uh, popcorn, or going to something like Mary's Gone Crackers, um, which is this um, oil-free, um, gluten-free um, cracker that's out there. Um, if they're craving something sweet, then instead of cookies and candies, we try to have them eat fruit and dried fruits. Um, and then if they're craving something a little salty and high calorie like cheese, then eating a little bit of nuts and seeds may be something that they can use as transition. So after the breakfast has become plant-based and the snacks have started becoming plant-based, then we start making changes to lunch and dinner. Um, a lot of my patients, they're willing to, um, they're a little reluctant to subtract things. So we say, okay, let's add salad to your usual lunch. Um, maybe try a bean burger instead of a beef burger. Um, try air fry potato wedges instead of French fries on the side. And then I, of course, always love fruit as dessert. So Doc, um, Chef AJ had mentioned that many of the listeners like to hear what we eat. So we made a slide on what lifestyle docs eat. Um, so a lot of times for breakfast, we'll have um, oats, either steel cut oats or just plain rolled oats um, with lots of fruits and berries. Um, and sometimes we'll even add things like cinnamon powder, cacao powder, um, amla powder. Um, and then another big part of our breakfast is green smoothie. And I noticed Dr. Brooke Goldner is one of the um, once a month regular now in Chef AJ. And actually it was her hearing her on a podcast once 
that got me started on the green smoothie. So I got her recipe and then we of course tweaked it now to where we are adding a few more things to it. Um, so her sweet recipe, and now I've also started um, alternating with Michael Greger's savory smoothie recipe. Um, if you guys haven't seen that, that's also a really great recipe. It's without fruit. So we use it a lot for our uh, di diabetic patients who are trying to um, reverse diabetes or um, put diabetes in remission. And right now their insulin sensitivity isn't so good. Down the road, they'll be able to add on the fruits. But right now we have them do the um, Michael Gre Greger's spicy savory smoothie because it has like uh, celery and bell pepper um, and greens. And, you know, it turns out really quite good. Um, and that too, we've tweaked a little bit to where we add more things, um, flax seeds, chia seeds, hemp seeds, walnuts, different things. So yeah, smoothie is an everyday thing in our house. Um, and then we'll also on the side have things like edamame or corn or, or veggies. So breakfast is big. Lunch, um, we bring to work. We'll have things like with that bowls, grain bowls, uh, leftover uh, lasagna made with a lot of veggies and tofu. And a lot of times we'll do like even um, there, you can get lentil pasta lasagna. Um, so it doesn't have like so much of the high glycemic index white flour lasagna. Um, and then a side salad usually. And then dinner a lot of times is whole grains with beans or lentils and fruit for dessert. And here are actually some pictures of some of our foods. Um, so I think that one has lentils or beans or a chili. Um, and then down there is the fruit plate. I can kind of see the lychees and different fruits um, that we put out. Um, and then the picture on the right is um, our potluck at our clinic. So we do, and this picture was actually just this past potluck, this Sunday. Um, we do once a month plant-based potluck at our clinic that is open to the community. You don't even have to be our patient. If you're in the Houston area, I welcome you to join us. We end up getting such delicious, healthy food and it's all um, no, salt, no oil and no sugar. People do use a little salt. Um, but definitely um, no animal products, no flour, no oil, and no sugar. Um, some salt is there, though. So that's really it. We are available for Q&A. Uh, if you have any questions related to the nutrition pillar of lifestyle medicine today. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think I'd like to do the questions that were sent in first. So let me find those. Uh, well, actually, there will be over here. And the first one is actually on fatty liver disease. Let me pull it up. And that was a great presentation, by the way. Thank you so much. I enjoyed it. The thing, whole thing about the genes, like that you can change the expression of your genes. Like, how do they know that? Like, I mean, that is just, that's phenomenal. But like, that's, I think yeah. that's. That's the coolest news that our that we're not that our DNA is not our destiny. Yeah, they do it from you know tissue cultures, from small, very simple organisms like yeast and other things. So a lot of the and now there's some mice studies also showing that, and they are just noticing if they feed mice, you know, a high fat American diet, they get the diseases, they get diabetes, they die prematurely. But if they feed them more whole plant foods, they live longer. And they, then they analyze the DNA of these mice and say, okay, this gene was turned on in the healthy eating mice, and this gene was turned on in the unhealthy foods. So it's really clever. I mean, it's amazing. They can do the precision. They can show that one gene is being turned on, another gene be, is being turned off. So it's really exciting. And there are human studies as well you, now, because I was doing a presentation, and uh, one of the studies I came across is one that was looking at the diet of African Americans and um, Africans in Africa, in Southern um, Africa. Um, and what they saw is what they did was just for two weeks, they fed um, the people in Africa an American diet of burgers and fries. And they fed people in America the usual South Africa diet with very high in tubers, um, very high, high in fiber. And in just, was it two weeks or 21 days? I can't remember, but it was less than a month. 
um, they started noticing that colon cancer genes were turning on in people um, who were in Africa on American diet and colon cancer genes were turning off in Americans being fed the diet from Africa. The reason they did that study is because an African-American is 13 times more likely to get colon cancer than somebody who lives in Africa. So, so that's, much is the diet. That's amazing. Okay, so this is from Elaine and she said, I would like you to please discuss fatty liver syndrome and how I can reverse it. Okay, all right. So um, fatty liver is basically, again, from the diet to where um, for different people, fat likes to go in different places. So I have even skinny patients with fatty liver. Um, and then I have morbidly obese patients with no fatty liver. So for some of us, the fat goes under the skin. For some of us, our cholesterol increases. For some of us, it goes to pancreas and the organs. So because it is still from the fat in the diet, um, as you go to a low fat, whole food plant-based diet, I've seen multiple patients who their liver enzymes go back down to normal, which is the blood work is what mainly I see, but also in terms of imaging, um, when we order ultrasound and CAT scan, the fatty liver, I mean, you see that more, you saw that more as a radiologist, but we don't see the fat around the liver anymore. Yeah. So you can see the enzymes normalizing, which means fatty liver is no longer present, but you can also see it in imaging. You can look at the image, you know, one year ago, and it showed typical characteristics of fatty liver. And now they're in a healthier diet. The liver looks normal, no longer any fatty infiltration. So this is one of the very easy things that you can reverse if you just switch your diet. I believe I had interviewed Dr. Hanna Kalyova of PCRM, and they actually did research on that exact thing. They did a study, and it was the low-fat plant-based diet that was actually able to reverse fatty liver. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it has to be whole plant foods and the keyword low fat. Thank yeah. you for mentioning that. I think that's the hard part for a lot of people. Those nuts yeah. and seeds are quite uh, addictive to some of us. Yes. Yep. All right. Let's see. Are there any questions in the chat? <laughs> well, uh, John, John says, can one eat too much garlic? So, I mean, I think you can overdo anything. Yeah. So, you know, everything you want to do in moderation. And we want to say that, you know, if you're eating so much garlic, then maybe you're not eating enough ginger or not enough onions. So we want to eat a variety of diet. So, you know, what is uh, too much for one person may be perfectly yeah. normal for another That's person. True. You know, if you're of Italian descent and, you know, you ate garlic, you know, in, in liberal amounts and you can handle that very well, mm -hmm. you know, maybe that's not too much. But if you're kind of new to the plant-based world and you're not of Italian descent or Mediterranean descent, and if you notice, you know, some gas and some other GI issues, you know, it may be that it's too much garlic. You know, it could be lots of other things, but that could certainly be a contributing factor. Yeah. I think our body often gives signals. Um, so listening to our body is really important because I know for me, when I eat a lot of garlic, I get a lot of dreams at night. Um, and so I know to cut down on the garlic. So it's just also paying attention to what your gut feels like, what you feel like on certain foods and going by that. Yeah. I feel better when I cook my garlic, like eat it roasted when it's raw, it doesn't seem to agree with me for some reason. Yeah. 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 And, you know, and, and, and that's a good thing to know that, okay, my body does well with cooked, but not so much with raw. Yeah, absolutely. Let's see where we're going with this. Um, look, I'm sorry, my chat, there's just so many wonderful comments. So you can always look at them afterwards. Yeah. Epigenetics, people are saying, are you guys familiar with Dr. Bruce Lipton? Because somebody had mentioned him in the chat. I have heard of him, but I'm not familiar with his, you know, specific work per se, but that name has certainly crossed, uh, you know. It, his certain... just his work is interesting. He's not, he's not an MD. He, and he's probably not even a plant-based or vegan eater, but it's mm -hmm. just kind of interesting that, you know, some of the stuff that I, I've heard him say, Biology of Belief is the name of his book. Okay. Oh, we'll have okay. to look it up. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting. Um, Mary says, but how can you access whether you have fatty or liver, or liver disease or trending? Because it's, it's a symptomless disease pretty much, isn't it? 
Yes, it is. But um, you can definitely get blood work done. Um, and you can, if you're really curious, you can get imaging done. And if they're both normal, then you don't need to worry about um, fatty liver. And most doctors will do complete metabolic panel as part of annual checkup every year. And comprehensive metabolic panel does check your kidney function and your liver function. So it tests your liver enzymes every year. Nice. I apologize if you're if you're hearing knocking, but it's, oh boy, this is how it is. Um, okay, me, we're not hearing much of anything at all. Yeah, good. Oh, so I'm so I'm so glad. I'm so glad that it's not that you're not doing that. Fantastic. Do you do you see patients virtually or only where you practice? Both, but only in Texas. Only in Texas, but anywhere in Texas. Okay. Anywhere good, in good. Texas. Yeah. I'm told you can even like visit Texas to have a virtual appointment. Like you don't actually have to live there. You just have to be at the yes, state. Yes, I have a patient and... from Louisiana and Oklahoma that way. Yeah. <laughs> that's very cool. You know, that's one thing kind of interesting, the, the, the pandemic is that so much more is virtual now that, and, and it's helped a lot of people get, get, you know, talk to doctors like you that maybe before they wouldn't have been able to. Yeah. Yeah. And we're really trying to spread the word that they can see someone in their own community. But if that's challenging right now, you know, we can see them anywhere in Texas. That yeah. And even outside Texas, when patients call us, we try to find them a plant-based doctor near them. Uh, I refer them to PCRM's website so they can put in their zip code and they can try to find somebody um, who can help them on their plant-based journey. Nice. Here's a question from a live viewer named Tammy. What causes high ferritin levels? That is ferritin iron. Is that the iron? Yeah, it's it's a form of iron. Um, it actually uh, can it can be sometimes more uh, sensitive in the sense that before you get iron deficiency, I'll start seeing their ferritin being low before the iron actually gets low. It's part of the iron studies. Um, so they're actually asking about not low ferritin but high ferritin. Is that right? Yes. What causes okay. ferritin levels to be high? So ferritin can also be a marker of inflammation. Um, so we do also see the ferritin levels rise as other inflammatory markers rise. So that may be something. Now, there is another thing called polycythemia vera, which is when there's too much um, red blood cells and too much iron in the blood, and that can cause the ferritin to be high. And then there's another thing called hemochromatosis, which is uh, a bit of iron overload in the body, and that can cause ferritin to be high. So it can be several things, but you have to look at other blood work too to try to figure out, like if their hemoglobin and hematocrit is high too, or it's just the ferritin high alone. If ferritin is the only thing high, then I would say it's more of an inflammation marker that's making it. Right. People are just wanting the clarification. So you can just ask for a blood test to see if you have fatty liver? Absolutely. Okay, nice, great. And here is another question. Uh, oh, how do you increase ferritin? Do you want to increase it? By, I mean, is that something? I mean, if it's low, if it's below the normal range, then you do want to increase it. For some women who have really heavy periods, um, they can have low iron and ferritin after their periods and feel kind of tired and weak. Um, the best way to increase those things is actually dark leafy greens. I've had a lot of patients do green smoothies. Um, and one of them, she said she, she has like alpha thalassemia or beta thalassemia genetically. And she's always kind of had low, uh, she's always been anemic. And then when she started doing green smoothies, um, she wasn't even trying to improve her iron and ferritin. She was just doing green smoothies for weight management and other reasons and being plant-based. When her labs came back, she said, this is the first time in like 20 years that she's had blood work that her iron and ferritin and hemoglobin hematocrit are all normal. And the only thing we could attribute it to is the um, green smoothies. And green smoothies are great because mm -hmm. you also add a bit of fruit to it and vitamin C helps you absorb iron better. And we also add things like flax seeds and chia seeds to it. And that takes away the bitterness of the greens, but it also helps with the absorption of the nutrients. Nice. Oh, thank you. Here's one uh, from Sharon. What do you suggest for chronic pain due to fibromyalgia? So, you know, fibromyalgia is an autoimmune disease. And this is really, you know, before, you know, we had really good data on, 
diabetes on obesity that if you switch to a plant-based diet, you know, it works really well. We don't have as much data with autoimmune diseases, but that is growing. So one of the main issues with autoimmune diseases is your microbiome, your gut health needs to improve. So once we can slowly transition to more whole plant foods, which have lots of fiber, lots of prebiotics, and then you can really sort of change the microorganisms that are in our gut. And remember, these are what's controlling or really playing a big part in regulating our immune system. So once the immune system is in a healthier place, autoimmune diseases, whether it's fibromyalgia, ulcerative colitis, rheumatoid arthritis, you know, we're seeing lots of patients, including in our own clinic, that we're able to put these folks in remission and off of all medications. We recently had a patient with Sjogren's syndrome that she's completely off her medication and has no symptoms. And, you know, this is one that was a new one for me. And I said, you know, it's an autoimmune disease. Let's give it a try. And she worked really hard, switched her diet. And really, you know, she is off all her medications and really doing quite well. Right. Regarding fibromyalgia, I know we're talking about nutrition today, but I do want to say there's also a big link with sleep in fibromyalgia and big link with exercise in fibromyalgia. So you want to improve your nutrition, but you also want to get that exercise and sleep component in because they do also really help um, resolve a lot of the symptoms. Yeah, fantastic. Let's see. There's a question. Is there anything unhealthy about air frying? So this is getting into sort of advanced sort of stuff. So, you know, if you're eating uh, whole plant foods and, you know, that would obviously be the best. If you're eating steamed potato, baked potato with the skin on, that would be the preferred way. So, but, you know, every once in a while as a treat, if you want to cut up some potato wedges and air fry them, you know, it's not the end of the world. And the reason they are not as good as steamed or baked potato is because, when you take temperatures to really high dry heat, okay, they create a lot of AGEs, so advanced uh, glycation end products. And these are something that's, again, going to cause damage to our cells, damage to our DNA. They lead to premature aging. So if you're eating them on occasion, and I want to make the point, I would rather you air fry than fry those uh, potatoes in oil. Yeah. <laughs> so that's definitely a much healthier alternative. But, you know, not doing it on an everyday or a routine basis, you know, make it a treat that you do every now and then would be so good that way. <laughs> I, I actually air fried my sweet potato for lunch today yeah. because I just I, I don't do it every day, though. But anyway, here's a question from Mary. Have you had positive results in helping people with severe asthma to heal and also with steroid dependence? Yeah, yeah. Actually, that was one of my exposures to plant-based diet is when a patient with asthma came in and um, said that she was off her steroid inhaler and off her single air. Uh, and she did that by being plant-based and specifically she attributed it to dairy, uh, getting off dairy. Um, so I actually then did a spirometry on her pulmonary function tests. Um, so I have the before when she was on the medication and after when she was off the medication, but on a plant-based diet and her numbers were actually much better. So it's not just subjectively that she felt better, um, but also objectively that her FE1 and um, all the spirometry numbers improved since then. Um, I have had other patients who I have encouraged them to, um, to go more plant-based and uh, specifically dairy uh, has a big effect on asthma, acne, um, allergies. Um, so yeah, I've seen that in many patients to where they were able to get off of steroids. And also they stopped having the episodes that they used to, like some of them used to have a hospitalization even, or ER visits at least a few times a year for their asthma, especially the season, certain seasons. Um, and after they've gone plant-based, they haven't had those at all. That's fantastic. John wants to know, what is the best test to determine the health of your arteries? 
So this is, you know, kind of getting into sort of advanced stuff, but I mean, you know, you can always do imaging, you can do coronary angiography, you can do these tests that are called advanced lipid panel tests. And there's some markers there that'll give you an idea of the endothelial cell health. And this is not something we do routinely, but if someone is really curious, there are laboratories that, you know, you have to usually get a mail out, you can't do it at the doctor's office. Uh, so there are specialized laboratories which will look at the endothelial cell health. So these are the cells that line the inside of the blood vessels. And that would be probably you know, the most direct way of assessing uh, your vascular health. And you could get like a calcium score right, study that's a... um, that will also give you information. It depends on where you're looking. If you're wondering about peripheral vascular disease, like. Um, your legs hurt when you walk. If you're thinking there may be blockages there, then there's actually ultrasounds of the legs that they can do looking at the arteries of the legs. Um, yeah. Oh, nice. Elaine wants to know, are there any specific foods to help with neuropathy? So this is a very, I shouldn't say common question, but fairly common question because diabetes is such a big part of our practice being here in South Texas. And one of the, uh, things that diabetics struggle with is neuropathy. And sometimes the neuropathy will improve in a matter of a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. Their A1C will have gone down very little, and but the patient reports, as I'm transitioning to healthier foods, my neuropathy is so much better. So it's really, it's sort of dose dependent. You know, if there's still a lot of processed foods and animal foods in their diet, and they're adding some plant foods, that's not going to do the trick. You really have to do predominantly whole plant foods. But if they can do that, even for a couple of weeks, one of the first things we see improve fairly routinely is neuropathy. That's wonderful. All right. Da, 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 da. How quickly can you bring down high cholesterol and high triglycerides on a whole food plant-based diet? So it's again, sort of dose dependent. If you are ready to plunge into the deep part of the pool, you go all in, you can do it in as little as two weeks. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's really whatever the patient is able to do. And sometimes, you know, when I first started, I really encouraged the all in approach and that worked for a lot of patients. But for some of the patients, they kind of went all in and were overwhelmed and they kind of, there was a backlash. So really, whatever works for you, if they want to go fast, they can go fast. If they want to go slow and sustainable, fast and sustainable, whatever works for them, but literally in a couple of weeks. Yeah, because when they do these kickstarts, uh, like Rochester Lifestyle Medicine and Plant Pure, um, they'll check 10 days later, and it's already better. In my practice, I usually check three months later, just because insurance will pay for it every 90 days. Um, they won't pay for a lipid panel so soon. Um, and within three months, yeah, definitely see major changes. Elaine, who asked the question about neuropathy, is saying she actually has non-diabetic neuropathy. Okay. So, you know, it depends why the damage was there. You know, was it from, you know, some sort of trauma? Was it a result of some other chronic disease? Was it the result of medications, maybe even chemotherapy? So there's a little bit of variation, but in general, if it's another chronic disease, especially, then that can definitely be helped. And some of the, even folks who uh, had chemotherapy yeah. for whatever reason, even they show pretty significant mm -hmm. improvement because, you know, a lot of it's inflammation, right? So that's what's causing the neuropathy is the local inflammation. And once you're eating healthy whole plant foods, which are going to knock down the inflammation way down that most people, you know, regardless of the type of neuropathy, they should, should see some benefit. Great, thank you. Oh boy, we've got, we've got let's see, you know, I know you guys have to oh, work. Uh, oh, can you lower triglycerides quickly if you're in the process of losing significant amounts of weight? Absolutely. And, you know, a lot of times, I, I don't wanna start that open that can of worms, but, you know, losing weight alone can lower the cholesterol oftentimes, triglycerides a lot of times, but really the healthiest way to do it is from whole, low fat, whole foods, plant-based diet. Yeah, thank you. And I, triglycerides come down even faster than cholesterol. Um, yeah. 
Fantastic. Some people worry about eating too much fruit with triglycerides. Is that is that something to worry about? So, you know, it depends where the patient is. If they're 35 and don't have any chronic diseases, I tell them eat as much fruit as you want. But, you know, if they're a little bit older or maybe have diabetes or other chronic diseases, I still don't limit the amount of food. I just say you eat more vegetables than fruit. Then if you can do that, I don't care which fruit you eat, when you eat it, I just want your plate to have more vegetables than fruit and you can do it. And don't make the fruit avocado because that's the one that's high in fruit. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> People eat all the fruit you want and then it tubs of guacamole. Well, this is wonderful. So what, what lifestyle medicine principle will you be discussing next month? So next time we're going to talk about physical activity. We're going to talk about exercise and how, you know, especially for losing weight, how nutrition and physical activity kind of go hand in hand. And we'll kind of look at the nuance that to lose weight, you really need to focus on your uh diet, but to maintain the weight, then exercise importance increases. And we'll kind of parse that on the next show. Do you have time for one more quick question that just came in? Because this is where a lot of the confusion comes. Uh, yes. is saying, how much avocado and nuts per day do you recommend to keep your cholesterol down? I have zero. Okay. So again, you know, it depends where you are. So, you know, if you're trying to maintain a healthy body weight, you are struggling with chronic diseases, then the right answer is zero. But if you're 30 and, you know, you're doing marathon training or really active, you know, you can get away with some nuts and seeds and avocados. So really it depends on the person and, you know, what your health goals are. Right, exactly. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure when you guys come on. I really appreciate it. And I hope everyone will get those questions in in advance. So thanks so much. Oh, it's our pleasure. We look forward to seeing you again next month. I can't wait. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow for two shows at 11 a.m. We have Vegan Conversations with Roger Cheek, where he interviews vegan athlete Natalie Matthews. And at two o'clock, oh, docs, you're going to like this. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of Dr. John Scharfenberg. He is a almost 100-year-old Loma Linda physician who was the teacher of Dr. Hans Diel. He's like a oh. real tre- he's a, he's a treasure. I mean, I I don't know him yet, but I mean everything I've you're heard gonna him. get to know him tomorrow. Awesome! <laughs> I can't I can't wait? I mean, because yeah. he'll be, he'll be the, the the second oldest person I've had on the show. Oh, fantastic! Wow. Thanks yeah. for letting us know. Yeah. Absolutely. Take care. We'll see you next month.